Romans chapter 12 is where we are currently. Romans chapter 12. And let's pray. God, we thank you for giving us this gift of being able to gather together. I know we thank you so often for this, but it really is a gift. And it's one that we intentionally make sure, make certain that we never take for granted. We know that uh, our ability to gather like this is fleeting. We saw that in the last few years. It could be taken or tried to be taken from us. And uh, Lord, we want to soak up every second while we still got it. And to build each other up in this most holy faith, we are so thankful how you've designed the body, how every part does its own special work, how you're the source of all energy and inspiration. And you minister to us through us as we all exercise these unique gifts that you've given to us. And we're so thankful to see all of that happen. So thankful to be the called out ones, the gathering of the called out ones. And um, we ask that you're glorified in our midst. Thank you for not being ashamed to call us your brothers and your sisters. That still blows our mind. Thank you for being willing to call us friends. Thank you for being willing to call us to be a part of what you're doing in our communities and in our families. We're very thankful for this, Lord. And we, we see it as a privilege, a restricted honor, uh, one that we want to um, be faithful in. And so uh, equip us today, train us, Lord, disciple us, teach us your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Lord, your servants are listening. Please speak in your name. Amen. So the Apostle Paul had a, a habit in a lot of his letters. He would begin with doctrine and end with application. He would begin with our identity in Jesus, who we are in Jesus, all that we have in Jesus. And then he would end with how we live this new identity in Jesus out. How do we live this out in the daily he did this in a lot of his letters. He did this in Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. He also did this in the book of Romans. Now, in Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, you can almost draw a line down the middle of the letter and see that division between doctrine and application. For example, in the book of Ephesians, it has six chapters, and Paul spends the first three chapters going in-depth concerning who we are in Jesus, what we have in Jesus, how what we have in Jesus is in the heavenlies and how he's given us this high and holy calling, all of us, this high and holy calling to follow him. So the first three of six chapters. And then right in the middle, when chapter four begins, halfway through, he transitions from doctrine to application. He transitions from who we are in Jesus to how we live out our identity in Jesus. And he has this transitional statement where he says, I, therefore, as the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Another translation says, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. And this word worthy means equal to. And Paul, he invests the first part of his letters to give us something weighty, our identity in Jesus. And then he spends the second part, he invests the second part of his letters to talk about how we are to live out our identity in Jesus. And he says they should be of equal weight, as awesome as it is to see who we are in Jesus and how he's had mercy on our lives. When you respond to that truth, oh, let it be just as weighty, just as impactful to the watching world. That's why he uses these intense words like beseech and beg I beg you to live a life worthy of your calling. I beg, I beg you to live a life equal to your calling. I beg you to live out a life that reflects your calling in your day-to-day -day lives. Well, in the book of Romans, he does a similar thing, but his transition from doctrine to application isn't exactly in the middle of the letter. Apparently, he had a little bit more doctrine in the beginning of Romans, before he got to the application, but that doesn't mean that the application is any less weighty or any less intense. I was thinking about it before service started, and actually, we're starting the application at chapter 12, right? And there's 16 chapters in the book. Paul spent the first three chapters telling us who we were, who we were apart from Christ. And then he spent chapters 
4 through 8, telling us who we are in Christ. And then he spent chapters 9 through 11 talking about the nation of Israel and God's plan for his covenant people. So it is actually almost an equal division, isn't it? Chapters 4 through 8 talk about who we are in Jesus, our identity in Jesus. And then chapters 12 through 16, how we're to live out that identity in Jesus in a weighty, an equal, a worthy way. So listen to just the first two verses of now Paul talking about how we apply this identity. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And reading this intense bit of application, I had to respond in a central Minnesota way, and I wrote in my notes, oofta. Yeah, that's what we say, right? I mean, wow, Mm, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. This is our reasonable, rational, logical service in view of all that God has done for us. In view of his mercies, how could we be doing anything else? It's intense, and rightly so. After Paul has given us 11 glorious chapters describing for us in detail Jesus and what Jesus has given us, and who he has made us to be, our identity in him, and how Jesus sees us, and all that we have in him. And so as we begin this transition from doctrine to application, these two verses are the only two verses that we're going to look at today. And I have to say, Lord willing, we'll get through these two verses, (laughs) because there's a lot here. Now, I know last week we went through an entire chapter, 36 verses, We did that in an overview fashion. This week, we're going to slow way down. We're going to unpack and unfold and look at over and over again these two verses because they're just that pivotal. We're going to go slowly and thoughtfully, carefully and intentionally, and we're going to ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? You know, really, there's two questions that come out of our soul when we're working through the Word of God, when we're reading the Word of God. There's two questions, and they're, they're connected to the two distinctions that Paul makes in his letters, doctrine and application. They're actually the two questions, the very two questions, that Paul first asked when he was confronted by Jesus. Do you remember? Here he was trying to find love and acceptance in all the wrong ways. He was trying to earn it and deserve it, and he was frustrated by not receiving it. And then he went out to destroy those who had received it by faith. And Jesus met him and knocked him off his high horse of religious superiority. And he spoke to him full of grace and truth, knocked the scales off his eyes. And for the first time, Saul, who would be Paul, saw the mercies of God in the face of Jesus. And he asked two questions. He asked, who are you, Lord? The second question was, What do you want me to do? Aren't those the two questions we're asking when we're reading the word? We want to know who he is. Who are you, Lord? I'm going to look from the beginning of time to the end of time and how you interacted with people and how you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Who are you, Lord? And as that first question starts to be answered, that first cup starts to be filled up, it pours into the second, doesn't it? Well, if you are... If you really are who you say you are, my life is yours. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? So I'm thankful that Paul does this in telling us who we are in the Lord. And then he transitions into giving us practical ways that we can live this identity out. That's why he starts, he begins this section on application by saying, I beseech you, therefore... Brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your 
body is a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, two verses. We're slowing down. Let's listen to these two verses in a few other translations. So just hear the word of the Lord and listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you, directly to you. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So that was the New Living Translation. Listen to the children's Bible. Brothers and sisters, God has shown you his mercy. So I am asking you to offer up your bodies to him while you're still alive. Your bodies are a holy sacrifice that is pleasing to God. When you offer your bodies to God, you're worshiping him in the right way. Don't live the way that the world lives. Let your way of thinking be completely changed. Then you will be able to test what God wants for you, and you will agree that what he wants is right. His plan is good, and it's pleasing and it's perfect. So that's the children's Bible. Now, the message, paraphrase. It's a paraphrase, not a translation, but it comes from a poet and a pastor. As he is teaching the Word of God by expounding upon it, by saying, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. Isn't that good? One more. The Phillips translation. Listen to this one. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable by him. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within that you may prove in practice the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and moves towards the goal of true maturity." That last one, I just love it. It's so good. I'm going to read it again. (laughs) With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable by him. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may be able to prove in practice that plan of God for you is good. It meets all of his demands, and it moves towards the goal of true maturity. Okay, so those two verses, we're looking at them from all angles. We've read them in a number of other translations. Now we're going to go back, and we're going to look at these two verses just a few words at a time. The first word in the translation that I read from the beginning is I, and I bet we could spend an entire Sunday on that first word, couldn't we? Because who is I referring to? It's referring to the Apostle Paul. 
We have to admit that there's an additional weight to the words because these are coming from the Apostle Paul. And that weight doesn't come from his authority or his spirituality. The weight comes from his failings. The weight comes from his fumblings, which Paul made so public. Remember what Daniel had put on the screen, the verse? Here's a trustworthy saying deserving a full acceptance. Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I am the worst. (laughs) But... He had mercy on me as an example to anyone that would come after me to be able to say pretty simply, if God can love him, he can love me. So there is a little weight to the words in addition to this being inspired by the Spirit, by the fact that he poured, God poured his unadulterated truth through the prism of Paul's life and personality. I beseech you. I beseech you. I beseech you. It's a cool word, isn't it? I love that the New King James didn't take it out. I beseech you. Now, the word that it's translated from is is an even better word. It's parakaleo. It's two Greek words put together. It means to call alongside, to call close, to call close to one side. And the picture that's painted, there's someone who is hurting and needs help. And you put an arm around them and you bring them in close and you speak something important to them. And you parents, I'm, I, you friends, I'm sure you can see this. Parents with teenagers, haven't you done this? They're on the edge of making a good or a bad decision or maybe they've made a bad decision and then you call them close to your side and you speak tenderly to them, words of exhortation and comfort and encouragement and oftentimes that word of exhortation and comfort and encouragement is please learn from my mistakes and don't learn from yours. Please learn from my mistakes. I beseech you, I, Paul, beseech you. I'm becoming increasingly convinced of this, that nobody is born with wisdom. Wisdom comes from taking good notes when you make mistakes and then making changes going forward. And then you see someone about to make that same mistake and you come alongside them and you call them close and you go, oh, I've been where you're about to go. And I'm trying to let you know that There's nothing good for you there. Please walk this out. I beseech you. Now, I think it's so great for us who are learning as servant leaders to see that he was begging them. He was inviting them. He was giving them an option to listen to him. He didn't command them. And Paul was very fond of doing this. He did this over and over and over in his letters to his friends. I plead with you. I invite you, I beseech you, I beg you. 1 Corinthians 1.10, he says, I plead with you, brothers, that you all live in unity and there wouldn't be any divisions among you. 2 Corinthians 6.1, he says, we then as workers together for him, for him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Ephesians 4.1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Philemon 1.8 says this, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you to do what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I would rather appeal to you. I'd rather beseech you, invite you, beg you. The choice is yours, though. Beseech is to call close, to call to one side, to plead, to implore, to urge, to exhort, to comfort, And Paul says, I beseech you, therefore. I'm looking at the clock. We've only gotten through four words. Maybe we won't get to verse two. I beseech you, therefore. What does that mean? Therefore. Therefore means in light of all that I've said before. In light of everything you heard in chapters one through 11. I'm calling you close to beg you, to plead with you, to urge and exhort you, brothers, sisters, Brethren, that's the next word, isn't it? I beseech you, therefore, brethren. What does that mean? It means brothers, sisters. It means family. Isn't it true that there is a level of intensity that you can have in a conversation with family? I hear all the muffled giggles. 
than you could have with anybody else. And it's important. One of the reasons why you can have that level of intensity with family is because you know at the end of the day you're stuck with each other, right? You're still family. You're still going to be my brother. You'll always be my brother. You're always going to be my sister. And God paints that picture for a reason because he wants to have us to have that kind of commitment with each other that we could sit down and have a family conversation, and it can be intense. And at the end of the day, we're still brothers. We're still sisters. I remember one of my first jobs after college, I had a supervisor who claimed to be a Christian and was living often in sin, and my heart was breaking for them. And so I worked up the courage to ask if I could have a conversation with them. And I began the conversation by saying, listen, I know that you're my supervisor. I know that you're my superior and I'm your subordinate, but could we have a conversation outside of all of that and we could have it as, as family in the Lord, brothers and sisters in the Lord? And I went on to just kind of lay out what's happening and how my heart is breaking, and they received it as a brother, as a sister in the Lord. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Other translations say, in view of the mercies of God. You can see the mercies of God. In view of all that God has done for you, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, brothers, I mean, with eyes wide open to all that he has done for you, And think of all the mercies of God that we've gone through in chapters 1 through 11. I mean, we went through justification. It's a big word, but here's what it means. Just as if you had never sinned. What? Yes. God has justified you because of Jesus. This is how he sees you. Just as if you had never, ever, ever, ever sinned in any way, shape, or form. Mercy of God in clear view. He talked about our adoption into the family of God, how we were called to the table. There's a seat reserved for us, sons or daughters, full rights and privileges. He talked about our identification with Jesus, how this is how he sees us now, in the blood of Jesus. He talked about how we're placed under grace now, no longer under the law. And since we're under his grace, under his unmerited favor, We can expect God to be kind and good to us, even and especially when we don't deserve it, because that's what grace is. We talked about how he has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. What a mercy. You know, there's some errant doctrine out there that says that you have to be holy in all of your actions before you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's just not true. David was a murderer and an adulterer, and in his repentance, he said, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And God didn't. God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit in his mercy. What a mercy. The Holy Spirit given to us to help us, to teach us, to empower us, to lead us, to direct us, to edify us, to exhort us, to comfort us, to seal us, to pray for us, to protect us, to transform us, and to walk with us. God's mercy in clear view. And then he gives us the blessed assurance in Romans 8 that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mercy, mercy, I beseech you therefore, Brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, in view of his mercies, with eyes wide open to his mercies, to offer yourselves, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, to offer your self, your, your soul, your heart, your everything as a response to his goodness, to see it as a reasonable response, a rational response, an intelligent response, an act of worship, to clearly see how good he's been to you 
and then respond like, how could I do anything other than say, Lord, I'm yours. My everything is yours. I'm wholly yours. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I love that it says this. It's an act of worship, but it's reasonable. It's rational. It's logical. When we have God's mercies in view, I mean, incredible for Paul to lay out in a layered and logical and impactful way over 11 chapters so many of God's mercies, but not even all of God's mercies. I mean, do you realize it took us over 40 studies to get here? 40 studies of viewing God's mercies. And then we finally get to our response. And in view of all that we've gone through, therefore, in view of all that we've gone through and all that he's done for you and all that he's done for me, the only reasonable, rational, logical, intelligent act of worship is to say, I am yours. I am continually offering my everything to you. I'm continually coming to the altar and giving you my everything. How could I not? after what I've seen, after what you've done for me. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an act of worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable by him, coming to the altar and staying there, continually fixed upon the mercies of God, responding to the mercies of God by continually offering our everything to him. And it's important to fix our eyes on Jesus because we have a competing entity called the world that would like to distract us from Jesus, would like to distract us so that we don't have his mercies in view, so that we don't have eyes wide open to his goodness towards us, that we'd look away or have something in the way, a competing affection so that we forget to offer ourselves continually and wholly to him. And that's why verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, I love the way the Phillips translation renders it. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. And that's what's happening. Apart from our eyes, our gaze fixed upon Jesus, this is happening constantly. The world with its own philosophy is a competing entity, and it's competing for your attention, for your affection, for your devotion, and it's providing a multitude of distractions so that God's mercies are no longer in clear view. Maybe they're in partial view, or maybe they're completely blocked. But having eyes wide open fixed on the mercies of God will result in that reasonable, rational, intelligent response. And so here's the diagnostic question for all of us. Just answer this honestly before the Lord. Does it sound completely reasonable for you to go to God right now and offer Him everything, to give Him everything? Does that sound rational or does that sound fanatical? Does that sound intelligent or does that sound foolish? If it doesn't, if it doesn't, there's no judgment here. There's no condemnation. It's just diagnostic. If it doesn't sound reasonable, if it doesn't sound rational, if it doesn't sound intelligent, there's something in the way of God's mercy. There's like his mercy is not in clear view. Or maybe you haven't had that time to even see his mercies fully. So the prescription is to give that time to see, to see his mercies fully, to see in totality what he has done for you. And then as he lays out the race that you're to run, 
to lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily entangles. Notice how there's two categories there? There's sin in our life that's just obvious sin. You know it and God knows it and God knows that you know that he knows it. Lay it aside. But then the writer of the book of Hebrews says that when you're running the race marked out for you in view of his mercy with eyes fixed on Jesus, don't just lay aside the sin, but also lay aside the weight. What's the weight? It's things that aren't necessarily sin, but they're slowing you down. I mean, you can run, you know, an 800 meter sprint with moon boots on and holding two suitcases if you want, but it's not exactly intelligent. You're not going to run the race in such a way as to win the prize. So in view of God's mercy, does it seem to you reasonable, rational, intelligent? You understand how it's an act of worship. If you don't in any way, and I know this is true in my life, it was true in the psalmist's life. Do you remember when the psalm was at 73 where the psalmist was like, man, what is the point of worshiping God? It just seems like all these wicked people who want nothing to do with God keep getting ahead in life. I work hard and I just keep going backwards. I keep getting punched in the gut. What's the point of serving God? I don't understand. And then it said in the middle of the psalm, and then I went into the sanctuary of God. And I understood. I could see his mercy right in front of me. There was this innocent animal who was slaughtered for me as a direct result of my sin. And the Lamb of God comes, and he's the one whose blood was let so that I could be with God, so that I could have a seat at the table looking at that. How could I say, God, you can have this much of me and this much of what I have? The more and more and more and more and more that I look into his mercies, the easier it is, the more reasonable it is, the more rational it is, the more intelligent it is to say, God, here's my everything, all of me. I can see clearly right now, and I don't want to leave this place. I want my eyes fixed on you. I don't want to wander away from the altar because the world has some stupid bauble or some wandering affection. And sometimes it's not a wandering affection or a shiny object. Sometimes it's just hurt and pain, right? Is hurt and pain and difficulty in the way of God's mercy? You know, he can deal with that too. I love how he dealt with Job at the end. What did he do? He just revealed himself to Job. He didn't even answer any of his questions. He answered all of his questions with, here I am. Look at me. And when we do this, when we consider him, when we behold him in all of his glory, when we have eyes wide open to his mercy, it will happen. There's a process that takes place. And this process is what helps us to discern God's will. It helps us to respond to his goodness. It helps us to determine what is the next right thing and have the power to do the next right thing. So two verses in, the Lord is just beginning to stir up our response. And I'm so thankful, like we said during the study, that he can have this kind of intensity in his conversation with us because he's family. And he's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. And at the end of our wrestling match with him, he's still going to be our brother. God's still going to be our father. And he continually calls us to himself. Let's sort this out. Let's talk this through. And I, as your pastor, would beseech you, beg you, implore you, go to God with his word and ask those two questions. Who are you, Lord? And then read his word. Then you finish and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? And then be quiet. And he'll speak. He'll give a soft, gentle, still small voice that will lead you to follow after his word and the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm so thankful for this. 
So, Lord, here we are, and we have considered your good work towards us. Lord, thank you for asking tough questions. I know there are so many times where my heart echoes that of the psalmist. We're getting our heads kicked in down here, Lord. You're letting people ride over our skulls. It's difficult. It's hard to see your mercies because of pain and difficulty. And I'm so thankful that you continually come alongside. Like those two on the road to Emmaus, what an experience. Lamenting the difficulty that they endured over the last few days, and then you came alongside of them, and you spoke your word to them, and their whole entire everything was changed. And they said, didn't our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us? And Lord, we know that you can do this anywhere, anytime. I pray that you would give us the grace to give you the opportunity to do that more regularly so that we more consistently can be intentionally at the altar and offering our everything to you, acknowledging everything as yours, giving our everything to you, Lord, and asking to be an instrument in your hands to bring you glory. May your will be done, Lord. We love you. We love you. We love you. Be gracious to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's worship the Lord together. You ever gone on a really, really long road trip? And uh, maybe in the summer, in bug season, and then you get back and you start that process of getting all the gunk off the windshield and off the front of the grill and all that kind of stuff. And you could spend hours and hours and there's just some stuff that just can't get removed. Sometimes our soul can feel like that. We've had a really long trip through this life. And we've picked up a lot of gunk. A lot of gunk has hit us. We're trying to see God's mercy and respond accordingly. And we just feel like we just can't get whatever's in the way out of the way. Whether that's sin or failure or transgression or just pain in our past or fear of pain in our future. And it's just, it's blurring the mercies of God. He, in his mercy, can do all the cleaning and cleansing for you. All of it. All of it. All of it. And he's much better at it than we are. All we need to do is go to him and say, Jesus, there's something in the way. Please help. Please help. So would you guys all stand? I'm not even going to give you the opportunity to stand if you need God's help. Because we all do. We all need his mercy. So here we are, Lord, and we need your help. We need your mercy. Our hearts wander. We can feel it over and over. There's things that vie for our attention and our affection. and We don't want to wander, Lord. We just find ourselves wandering over and over. Lord, whatever's in the way right now that's obscuring our view from seeing clearly your mercy in its full intensity, would you have mercy on us and cleanse us and wash us with the water of your word? Lord, we are your bride. This is your heart. Your word says that you do this. So have mercy on us. And help us, Jesus. Help, Lord. Wash us with your spirit. Wash us with your word. Help us to see so clearly how much you love us, how you're never going to leave us and never going to forsake us, how much you're with us and for us, and you want to work in our lives. There's no condemnation towards us, only help. We're so thankful for you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, guys, read ahead and pray for our studies between now and the end of Romans. I really, really would love to see the Lord stir us up for love and good works.